Thank you very much. And stop prepping. Well done. Mm. How many tries did it take? Push the red button and it goes. It's just a red dot. Yeah. Mm. You press it and I turn it off. It's all recorded. Five to six, right? No. Yes. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. it's it's five to six. Yeah. Five. Yeah. Four to nine. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, Ladies and gentlemen, any attempts at a two-state solution in Israel and Palestine have utterly failed at this point in history. The talks aren't even getting off the ground. In fact, in the last couple of days, it's been shown that talks just literally aren't going to happen because both sides are backing off more and more. You're still getting things like wars and bombs being dropped. You're still getting a blockade that is starving the Palestinian people. We say that to, yeah, we have to give up on any concept of a two-state solution. Instead, what has to be installed in the area of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza is an entire single state with free movement throughout the entire region and with um, a democratic election to initiate the entire process su um, um, surveyed and looked over by the international community and the UN. We say that we have four points on this and we have four reasons why it is going to be extremely important. We, have, we say that, um, that the alternative has completely failed and it will never work. We say that um, these two, these two groups of people are capable of living together on the ground and capable of living with one another and working together as a state. We think that that's going to occur when you create this situation. We say, thirdly, that this does allow for something like state intervention to work better within this area and it allows for more, um, more interaction with the wider world. And we say that if you don't do this right now, you're going to create further radicalisation both within the two sides and within the region as a whole. We think that that's a massive problem. So, why is it that two states just hasn't worked? First of all, the arguments are largely on religious grounds, and the arguments are ones that are never ever going to come to anything. First of all, in order to create a two-state solution, necessarily Israel is going to have to back off a little bit and give a little bit of land. We say on the side of the house that is never going to occur. Why? Firstly, there's no evidence that it is. Israel has not got anything close to backing off. Instead, it's extending into Palestine at the moment. There's absolutely no sign that it's going to back off. Secondly, in all of the discussions, in all of the things like just freezing settlements within Palestine, Israel has never backed off and has never shown any sign of making any concessions whatsoever to a two-state solution. We say that that's not going to occur. Yeah. Second, a whole lot of the beliefs here are religious. There is absolutely no way that you're going to be able to agree on terms in terms of Jerusalem. We're literally within the same neighbourhood. Massive sites in terms of, of religious belief for both Arabic people and Islamic people and Jews occur. We say that there's not going to be any sort of solution when these religious beliefs occur. Religious beliefs are not rational. There's not going to be any way where you can safely draw a line there. We say, thirdly, and what I've already stressed, is that negotiations simply aren't working. There is no evidence whatsoever that a two-state solution is going to work. Secondly, we say that the problems that are arising here aren't to do with individual people on the ground. In Jerusalem at the moment, there are massive populations of both Palestinian people and Israeli people. There are both Islamic people and Jewish people on the ground there living together. In fact, Palestinians are a significant minority, if not a majority, within Israel, not just within Gaza and the West Bank. In terms of the whole region, this is important, there is actually reasonably equal levels of population between Jewish people and Islamic people. There is no, there is no like, obvious minority minority and if there is it's a significant one. We say that the, the people who are causing the problems are actually complete radicals within Hamas and also people within Israel who had um, problems in terms of the damage that's been done in terms of violence there. We say that on the ground people can live together, there is plenty of evidence that they are living together in terms of being able to live with one another and exist with one another. We say if there is a one state solution with this, this ability for everybody to live next to one another, to be able to enjoy living next to one another, we say that that, that is going to happen, that that can happen, that, that none of that problem is going to occur. Um, um, so thirdly, we say that in terms of how we're going to create the state, state intervention in terms of um, the international community being able to survey and supervise the state in its early stages is going to be much, much more possible in a scenario where you have these two sides working together. First of all, there are two obvious sides. Neither side, as has been shown in negotiations, is going to necessarily work with one another without that form of mediation in the immediate term. They have to, there has to be a scenario where they, have, they allow for supervision and for mediation. So when you talk, there's not going to be able to be things like Israeli troopers pointing guns at people. There's not going to be able to be things like blockades preventing um, Palestinian people from voting or something. You're going to have to see an immediate hold off of all of those things that Israel is currently doing in, in, um, in Palestine and so on. You're going to have to allow for UN troopers, for aid workers to be there during this process of the creation of the state. You allow for that to already exist a lot more. You allow for... Um, a, lot, a lot better supervision in terms of democratic elections to make sure that they are transparent. 
as it currently is in Israel, you're, you're getting perhaps un, 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 unfair electoral rights for Islamic people and Palestinian people within the voting community there. That would have to be taken away because there has to be immediate supervision with immediate voting in that, in that scenario of things like the UN and of America. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we say that if you don't do this, and we, we, we stress to the um, negative team in today's debate, if you don't do this, you're going to get massive problems of further radicalisation in the region. You need to have a, 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 something that, that actually cre creates something at all for t pe t people on both sides to grasp on in terms of getting along with the other side. All that we've seen in the last 50 years, before 1948, Jewish people and Palestinian people were living together and were happy to live together, and in some, some places they still do. Now you're seeing further and further radicalisation. It hasn't got to extreme proportions yet, but there is no reason why it couldn't do that. If bombs keep dropping, if Israeli people continue to starve people in Palestine with a blockade, we say that if you allow that, if you try and create something that stops that and stops that region being able to be radicalised. A further thing is in terms of regional radicalization. If there is a one-state solution here, suddenly places like Iran can't drop nuclear bombs on Israel because it's not Israel, it's a single state that includes Islamic people who have equal rights to those Jews in that state as well. Equal rights ensured by the fact that there is that intervention coming from the international community. We say that that isn't going to exist to nearly the same degree, and it won't exist. Um, all, all that radicalization of, of surrounding areas can't exist towards, the hate towards Israel can't occur because Israel as, a, as an entity doesn't exist. You have instead have a state where um, there are both Palestinian people and Israeli people. So ladies and gentlemen, for all these reasons, we're proud to propose. Ready, John? Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, Alec was right when he said that right now the two state solution is undergoing a few setbacks and there are problems and Israeli and Palestinian governments and people do distrust each other. But what he's profoundly missed and what the affirmative team need to clear up in their case if they can have any chance of you know, making any sense at all in this debate is why all those reasons that a two-state solution is failing don't apply when you try and have a one-state solution. And what we say on the negative side of that, and what we say, in fact, is intuitively obvious, is that all these tensions that exist when you have two states um, trying to negotiate across the international, um, you know, international diplomatic channels actually are going to get far worse and be exacerbated when instead of these negotiations occurring, you know, across and through international diplomacy, instead we're trying to have these negotiations occurring in a single House of Parliament. We say that if Jews don't like Hamas now, when they're a government in another country, how much do you think they're going to like Hamas when Hamas is a, is a political party sitting in the Israeli Parliament? And we say that that isn't going to work, and we say that um, the one-state solution is not going to be um, acceptable to the Jews, and it's not going to be acceptable to the Palestinians. We say that it's never going to work, that the Palestinians want their own state, that the Jews want their own state, and the only possible um, possible solution is in fact a two-state solution. So very quickly what I'm going to do is look at this um, from two perspectives. Firstly I'm going to show you um, in more detail why the one-state solution can't work. And I'm going to show you all these issues that Alex show, you know, brought up, which his speech was basically a list of all the reasons why Israelis and Palestinians don't like each other, which are kind of obvious. I'm going to show you why they're actually going to make the one-state solution so impossible. And then I'm going to move on and show you how, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, there have been solid steps towards a two-state solution, and that actually this is the more realistic, the more practical, and the more hopeful solution to the problem. So firstly, in terms of the one-state solution, what this means is sharing a state, sharing a government. And what we say on the negative side of the House is that this is going to produce a result that just falls into ethnic tension, that the only thing that's going to matter in the democracy is whether the Israeli or the Palestinian party gets more votes. And it's going to be something we've seen played out in lots of countries around the world where you have um, deeply riven ethnic tensions, and we've seen this all the time in Africa, is that when one ethnicity wins an election through means fair or foul, they use all their time and power to oppress the minority until, until the other side gets in power, and they, then they do exactly the same, tit for tat, back and forth. And Alex said, 
oh, Palestinians are already being oppressed in Jerusalem. Well, how much worse do you think it's going to be when the Jews in um, Israel are insecure about the possibility of Hamas ruling over their whole country and of them having to live in a state ruled by Hamas? How much more insecure do you think they're going to be? How much more oppression do you think is going to go on against um, Palestinians' democratic rights when the possibility of Hamas ruling Israel is like realistic? And we say that's not acceptable. And what we say is it's made even worse by um, if you look at the demographics of the situation, if you combine the whole of um, Greater Palestine together, within 10 years there's going to be an Arab majority. And we say that means it's going to be ruled over by an Arab party, and that means it isn't going to be a Jewish state, and it's not going to be a Jewish homeland. And we say there are sound historical reasons why the Jews deserve a homeland in the Middle East. We say that, um, you know, they've been. A race has been persecuted for centuries, and we say that it's not acceptable, bordering on anti-Semitic, to suggest that they should have to live under a um, Arab rule, um, Hamas dominated society, we say that's a recipe for oppression and for further ethnic tension and we're just not happy with this. So basically under a one state solution there are two possibilities. Either one, the Palestinians have their democratic rights suppressed and the only way the Jews cling on to a Jewish state is by suppressing Palestinians or two, that actually um, Israel is ruled by Hamas or by an Arab state and the Jews are oppressed and we say either one of those just isn't actually practical. We say that Alex like, oh they can live together fine. Well, first Firstly, that was contradicted by some of your own examples, but secondly, there's, there's a difference between people living together and sharing governance, because before 1948, you had Jews living in an Arab state, and uh, since 1948, you have Arabs living in a Jewish state, and we say that, that kind of works, but there's, it doesn't actually mean that there's shared governance, and we say that there's never been any history of successfully shared governance between these two ethnicities, and we say there never will be, and it can't work, and the only solution is a two-state solution. Um, and you know we could refer to the example of Northern Ireland. No one's going to suggest that we combine Northern Ireland with Greater Ireland. We say that wouldn't work and the only solution to that conflict was to have Northern Ireland remain Palestinian and the rest of Ireland to be a Catholic state. Um, and we say that there's a, there are sound reasons for that. Now let's move on to why the two-state solution can work. Firstly we say it's already been agreed in principle. We say that in the Camp David Accords and um, under Bill Clinton in the late 90s we say that they actually got very close to a solution and the broad strokes have been outlined and unfortunately at the moment both Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli um, Prime Minister and Hamas, both parties are ruled by extreme leaders but we say leaders change and eventually both parties will be ruled by more moderate leaders and we say there is hope for this to work itself out in the future and obviously things aren't working out at the moment but for all the reasons things aren't working out at the moment uh, they're all just reasons why a one state solution would be even worse but we need to hear from side affirmative or actual reasons why you know, what's making a two-state solution bad is actually going to be solved under a one-state solution. And we haven't heard any of those um, any of those reasons. The line on side negative is that any issues that are hard to work out when you have diplomacy and when you can use tact and when not everything is open um, to sort of sense uh, sensationalisation and examination by the media and fought over in the democratic realm to say that makes things more messy and harder to solve and all the um, strife is going to get worse and so for all those reasons we favour sticking with a two state solution on this side of the house. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Oh, sorry, I was waiting for a bit cool. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> for many, for me, oh, my bad. Oh, I can sell my bad. I don't want to do it. Yeah. See, I did that. Yeah.
forward push it. I know what you can see back a bit. No what? Uh, should we push on there? So I'm going to hold the outside of the pitch. Why so it's pretty simple. It's one side of each other. You can ask for donations to support your home, of course. And receive a free gift. Actually, that would make sense to sit at like a bath and sit because one does beer and does like miniature and like the rest of the band one does have vodka. Is everyone ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The main difference between a two-state solution and a one-state solution is what we say on the side of the house is that a two-state solution currently causes all the problems of radicalisation which Gavi wanted to point to which told us why a one-state solution will never work. Why is that? Because when you have Israel and Palestine going for a two-state solution, you incentivize them to vote for radical leaders because you essentially have an arms race to get the most weapons so you can then win those negotiations, right? So Israel and Palestine, Palestine has elected Hamas, right? And their tactic is to keep in sending suicide bombers. Israel have elected Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the most right-wing president in Israel for ages. And we say it's precisely on this basis that they want to try and win those negotiations is why you get all the problems. We say you undermine that incentive to build up and that is exactly why a one-state solution is different to a two-state solution. I've got three things I'm going to talk about. Firstly, I'm going to talk about why a two-state solution is structurally never going to happen. Secondly, I'm going to tell you why the state will work and why Palestinians and Jewish people are more likely to accept it. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about uh, gatekeep the harms that Alec brought up in terms of regional stability, which weren't responded to at all by Gary. So starting with this idea of why a two-state solution will never work. And the analysis here is, is what I told you in my introduction, but we also provided you reasons why that was the case in the introduction why negotiations will never be successful. Because when you've got a religious conflict between um, two uh, sort of contradictory things, they're never going to want to make concessions and agree on a particular thing to give up power to the other thing. So we say that they say, oh, like, you know, there's, there's, in principle, we all agree with it. Yeah, that's fine, right? That's good. But the problem is that's never going to happen because like religion necessitates that you, you know, follow your God, you get to go and see Jerusalem at whatever. So we say when you try and practically separate the Jewish and the Muslims, that they're never going to agree on concessions that the other makes, right? Hamas runs on a platform of wanting to totally annihilate Israel and get rid of them all in total. And moreover, we have told you that you know Israel has proven that it won't back off because of its current build-up of arms. And we, so, and we say that it has continued to encroach on Palestinian sovereignty and, um, and violate, it essentially, through Jewish settlements. And so how is this going to be fixed under um, a one-state solution, which is going to, what, what I'm going to look at in the second part of my speech. So why will the state be effective? Well, we say, firstly, that currently the borders between Israel and Palestine are very unclear because of the settlement breaches and the bombing that go on. What, when you have one state that is recognised by international law to be one state, that gives, the, that gives the international community greater justification to actually intervene and prevent um, various atrocities which go on, right? Because instead of Palestine and Jewish not accepting any international interventions because they're like, we don't recognise them in a state, they're not a legitimate state. They now are forced to recognise those people as being under their jurisdiction, so they're now subject to, to the international regulations, like you cannot bomb other people or, you know, go against what your, what your government says. And why, why will, why will, why will, what, and the second point I make under the setting is why will in fact Jewish and Palestinian politi politics moderate under the system? Why will we not get um, sort of radical leaders that will happen? And the reason for this is essentially is because the Palestinian plight is actually essentially while it's driven by this sort of like 
religious and sort of like God-driven zeal that we hate Israel on a macro level, the, the actual voters on the ground, they're concerned about the fact that they're in poverty at the moment, they're concerned about the fact that they don't get any access to education. And when you live under one state which is able to provide um, more resources as Israel you know, is a wealthier nation and, and the Palestinian people will have you know, a access to you know, basic services, um, then they are more likely to accept the concessions because they can see on the ground to them the benefits because now longer now now no longer do they have to go to the um, Hamas warlords to get their dinner when it can be provided to them from um, a state agency which will provide protection to them um, a, a, as they will be required to do so what we say on this point is that is that it's been is that it's been proven that the Palestinian um, people, if you actually look at why they vote and you analyse why they vote, they vote for the like party that's most likely to get them education and food. And Hamas was able to do that. We say that when you have a state and and, and you force them to like negotiate within a parliament rather than negotiating by sending bombs to each other, that you're more likely to get steps going forward. But moreover, you've broken the reason why they have such big conflict at the moment, which is because they want two different states and they want to be better than each other. When they no longer want to try and suck the other one up or totally annihilate the other one, they're then forced into a mindset of cooperating because it's in their mutual interest to do so. And Alec pointed you to the fact that for years they lived together, for thousands of years, and it's just recently, it's not like they go onto the street and go, that guy's a Jew, we hate him. It's, it's, a fact, it's the fact that they were kicked off their land and they, now look, and they don't have the resources that a state provides. Thirdly, what did Alec told you they didn't respond to? They didn't respond to his very good point that it removes the regional threat from other Arab states who care about the plight of the Palestinian peoples. We say Iran and Lebanon will no longer have justification to drop weapons on that and we say that's a massive benefit they need to respond to, we propose. I like that. <laughs> Would you like your internet banking password? Sure. It's not a password anymore, so. Just if, you, if, if you'd be trying to hack Just in my, case I was trying to steal our money. Yeah. Or oh, your money. <laughs> <laughs> it's your money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> almost spent it today. I need to make my slides pay rent. Yeah, it's like one of those. I like to pay rent, man. Pay rent. 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 Pay Please start getting like Hopefully, I'll get a back payment. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll wait. Yeah. And also, <laughs> when you're ready, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I applied for my two thousand dollar overdraft today. Don't do it. He invested. It's a loan, right? It's a loan, isn't it? No, it's it'll fine. probably it'll probably just be in the savings account this one actually. Because <laughs> I've got some debating later on that I might be spinning a bit on. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, get on with your speech. Mr Speaker, as we told you in our first speech, as Nick told you, that every single problem we currently see at the moment uh, in the two-state solution, we say, is completely compounded when you force those problems to be um, in a one-country sense. Because at the moment we see that both uh, groups, both Israel and Palestine, both have power to an extent over their own people and have their own like sovereignty over their own area and their own people rights. But now what you do is you put it into a situation where you have a country where it's basically winner takes all situation of either Jews leave the country where it, because obviously it's going to be you know political parties are going to be like there's going to be Jewish political parties there's going to be Arab political parties. Hamas is probably going to be the largest party in this new greater Palestinian area government. We're going to see very ethnically drawn lines and what we're going to see is that it's one group has power over the other, Mr Speaker. And it's even more ridiculous when we hear that, oh, people are going to get less radical when they live together. Well, if you're a Jewish person and there's a possibility of Hamas running your country and governing your laws, do you think you're going to get more 
extreme, or you're going to get less extreme, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Basically, I'm going to split. Firstly, we're going to talk about how democracy is going to work, and we're just going to talk about what has been untouched as more the demographic consequences and the implications of, of into the future where we see population and stuff. Secondly, um, is more the religious tensions that we have and why these are going to be compounded under a one-state solution and why the whole issue that we brought up that the app said is, oh, they've been living together for ages, so they can. And finally, we're going to talk about um, is more... I guess international intervention and why it becomes a lot harder for other countries to I guess help out in a sense once the one state solution starts off. So what, what, we, what we've heard is that in a, in, how would this democracy, basically what we've heard is that both countries will, it will basically one country, there will be no more arms race, so basically all people will care about is, is poverty and whatnot, and you know, they'll all be focused on education. Why is this wrong? We say firstly at the moment is that although both countries don't necessarily agree with each other in every single aspect, we say they are two separate countries. So they can have their own laws, they can have their own customs and cultural things um, with their own. But we say when you translate that into one nation, you have one uh, group of people, say as the Arabs, deciding laws which affect all Jewish people when they didn't have um, a say in that. That breaks down because what you have is you have one group of people which is being kind of um, controlled by the other group. That we don't think that democracy can work at all in the Middle East. The fact that they can't agree right now, even when they have their own set of rules in their own country and they can't agree with the person next door, when you throw them into the same house, Mr. Speaker, we say that they're not going to be able to agree on like even, you know, the, the very nature of like who's going to be running the government and stuff. We think that, and you take a look at Northern Ireland, um, where you know, obviously no one decides that we're going to chuck all the Catholics and Protestants into one country. So it's better to have a two-state solution. We say that um, is best in this case. And obviously on radicalisation, we say people are far more likely to radicalise when there is a fear that the other ethnic group is going to be controlling your group. That's what we're saying, is that when you're a, a Palestinian person, at the current situation, you're like, well, look, you know, I, I might be a Hamas voter, I might be for the other party voter, but I know I'm going to be living in a relatively Palestinian country, and I know those laws are going to kind of go unchanged between what some massive swing's going to be. You chuck it into the next version, right, and it's like, well, okay, it could either be this Hamas rule government, or it could be this, you know, Zionist kind of like Jewish um, government which is there instead and then you get very fearful of that. You start to uh, get laws where you're oppressing the voting rights of other ethnic groups. You think it's bad at the moment. You start to get um, what, what's the word? Um, gerrymandering and, and whatnot. <laughs> where, you, where, you, where you see like, um, where you see like um, exploitation of like electoral districts and things. And we say that that can't no democracy can work under violence. Anything violence as well. Ethnic violence is just as bad. Um, <laughs> more bad. <laughs> um, anyway. Now, on to religi religious issues now. Basically on this point, the only analysis we've had from the, the proposition is basically goes to as far as to say is look, they've lived together for a long time, so basically you can work under the system. It fails, like, it, it's not the same at all. What we've had, and like, if you look at Israel at the moment, right, it's not 100% Jewish. There's like, you know, a few Christian people there, there's a few Muslim people there in the, in the minority. But the reason that works is because it's largely, largely a Jewish state. The people there know that it's a Jewish state. They just happen to be a different religion living there, and they abide by those laws because they understand that. What we, pro what the proposition is proposing, is like a fundamentally like one state with two massive ethnic groups, where it's, it's not really one state or the other. What had happened about hundreds of years ago? There was a largely Palestinian state with a small Jewish minority who kind of could work within that framework. Now you've got battles over what that framework is. That's why it doesn't work. That's why it is different to peace that has been happening for hundreds of years. And because we now have two very large ethnic groups that are almost the same in population, we said that's why it's not going to work, Mr. Speaker. 
Finally, I just want to talk briefly on international intervention. What we say is that countries like the United States, countries like in Europe, countries like Turkey and Egypt play a very constructive role in like peace and international affairs and have a lot of like negotiations and stuff. That can't happen when it's one country because otherwise you're meddling in someone else's parliament and that's breaches of sovereignty and it gets a lot more complex. So for those reasons, we're proud to oppose. I'm sorry the speaker's a little down right? Mr. Mr Speaker, what we've had from an affirmative team is they've gone over and over and told us things aren't working at the moment and if we force these two ethnicities into the same state then everything is going to be great and to quote them ad nauseum, they'll be forced to work together. Well what we say is that smart white people thinking that forcing two ethnicities to work together um, just because they're one country is like the entire history of post-colonial Africa and we say that actually it doesn't work, it makes a bad situation even worse and we've challenged the affirmative team over and over for any kind of analysis why are these problems that are relatively intractable across the sphere of international diplomacy are suddenly going to get better if you stick them in one parliament? And what they've completely ignored is our analysis of sharing versus a winner-takes-all situation. Because what you, have, um, what you have under the status quo is negotiations, admittedly sometimes violent ones, over, over sharing, <laughs> sharing Greater Palestine and sharing access to holy sites and that each nation will get a state of their own. But what instead they want is every four years or whatever, you're going to have a fresh contest over who gets to rule the whole country. So every four years, you're going to get a winner-takes-all contest. And that's what happens when you have two ethnic groups in one country split down the middle. That's, you know, it's a, it's a time-worn road that they want to take us down and they haven't shown why it's not going to happen. They haven't um, answered our analysis about how if Jews are already oppressing Palestinians' democratic rights, why it's not going to get even worse um, when there's a threat of like a Hamas ruled Israel. They haven't answered our analysis about how it's not acceptable for us or for anyone um, to have, you know, a no Jewish ruled state, for the Jewish people not to have their own state. And they, they haven't painted any picture of any viable solution at all. All they've said is, well look, there are these really bad religious conflicts and that means a two-state solution is never going to work. Well, we say, yes, there are bad religious conflicts, and yes, there are possible solutions, but when you stick them all together in one country, it's going to get even worse. And what they also haven't answered is the problem of demographics. The fact that the um, Arab population is growing faster is going to mean that they will, in a, in a fair democracy, they'll dominate the country, and it means that the Jews will be have to resort to extremism to suppress the Arab population. Also, they haven't answered our analysis about the fact that it's, you know, there are very um, well-worn mechanisms for um, you know, third parties to help two countries who are negotiating with each other. But what isn't very good is when third party countries are helping um, political parties within a country negotiate. We say that gets a lot messier and there aren't the same avenues and there aren't the same procedures in place for that to happen. And we say that yes, we, we, we love it when other countries, both Western and Muslim, play a constructive role in resolving this conflict. But we say this happens much easier when you're dealing with two states rather than dealing with one state. When you know you have one ethnic group oppressing another ethnic group, it gets very messy and very difficult for um, other countries to come in and often you either have to ignore it or resort to military intervention and we don't want to go there. What we say is a two-state solution is the only possible solution and any problems we have now get worse under um, side proposition. Thank you. The entire negative case in today's debate is hinged on the idea that 
all of the problems that exist in the two-state solution are just going to get worse in the one-state solution. Mm, yeah. Next key problem that he just mentioned there, right at the end of his final leader's reply, was the population's increasing, and now the Jews are going to have to resort to even greater methods of suppression to destroy the Palestinians. Greater methods, okay, first of all, the population is still going to grow. But secondly, apparently they're going to have to resort to greater methods of suppression than war crimes using white phosphorus bombs and preventing the Palestinians from eating. Now, all throughout this entire debate, it has been completely conceded by the negative side of the house that things are continuing to get worse now in the two-state solution and that it is going to lead to greater radicalisation within the two parties and within the region. Why is that? Because they never even touched it. Because they've simply got up and said, oh, the one-state solution is going to have these problems. I'm going to talk to you about why it doesn't have those problems and why, in fact, things are going to be more moderate. And then I'm going to talk to you about the further radicalisation. I'm actually then going to talk to you about the idea of international community intervention and the idea of higher powers being more possible in this one-state solution. And also I'm going to talk to you about, um, the, about the, that regional instability. So very quickly, why is it that you're going to get a more, moderate, more moderation on the ground? First of all, there are people who are already moderate on the ground. You've got relatively moderate Israelis and relatively moderate Palestinians. Why is this? Because Palestinians just want to be able to eat, and because there is plenty of evidence that Israelis are actually quite moderate. First of all, they already live with Palestinians perfectly happily. But then if you look at some of the things that are coming out of Palestine, like the like out of Israel, like the fantastic film Waltz with Bashir, which shows that there's actually a lot of moderation and a lot of actually guilt about what's happening in Palestine within the Jewish community. Um, that actually there's plenty of examples that their moderation already exists. What we've had from the negative side is them stand up and say, well, now that there's all these threats, suddenly they're going to radicalise. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, I'm going to say democracy. They've come up here and proposed to you this idea that this is what democracy is. It's a fight off between these two groups. We, well, we think it's more likely to be a bit more like the Israeli conception of democracy as it was already, which is extreme MMP with lots and lots of different small parties that negotiate with one another all the time. We don't think there's going to be two massive blocks. We don't think that there's going to be this massive fight off on either side. There's always going to have to be concessions. There's always going to have to be better concessions in a parliament situation than there's going to be um, in a current situation which involves violence. Ladies and gentlemen, secondly, we, I mean, secondly, when you think about this whole idea of conceding to inter international community, when you've got these two groups together and they're facing this threat that they've said all along of extremism and of oppression, there's going to be greater realisation that there's going to be, there's going to be more want to institutionalise things like courts with the ability to have a bill of rights and things like that in those situations and the ability for an international community to intercede in those situations and stop that oppression from occurring. There's going to be more desire on that from both sides because both sides know that it could happen to them just as easily. So that's not going to occur either. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, they've never ever touched the analysis about radicalisation in the entire region as a whole. And the idea that if you have a one state solution, you're not going to get aggression towards that state because, first of all, it includes the Islamic people that the people around there like. And it also includes the Jewish people that people in America like as well. So for these reasons, Mr Speaker, we say absolutely um, that this would be a one state solution.